In this video, I'm going to be walking through my general approach to reading an ABG. And this is going to be part one of a multi-part video series where we're just going to be talking about the basics, determining whether or not something is acidotic versus alkalotic and metabolic versus respiratory. In part two, we're actually going to be talking about the different causes and walking through an algorithm of metabolic acidosis and alkalosis. So the first thing is the different components. And it's just the very basics. You're going to have a pH, pHCO2, PaO2, and bicarb in an ABG. A pH of lower than 7.35 is going to be acidic, and anything higher than 7.45 is going to be considered basic. And once we determine whether or not something is acidotic versus alkalotic, we have to start thinking about respiratory versus metabolic. And the easiest way to look at this is to look at the CO2 and think about CO2 uh, has to do with respiration. We always look at respiratory acidosis versus alkalosis in components of CO2. So a high CO2 uh, means that we are hypoventilating, means we're retaining all the CO2, and it's going to lead to an acidosis because essentially CO2 is going to eventually break down into hydrogen ions and that's going to be leading to an acidosis. A low CO2 means we're hyperventilating and we're blowing off all this excess carbon dioxide. It's going to lead to an alkalosis. The converse is going to be true with metabolic. When we think about metabolic, we're always thinking about bicarb. The kidneys regulate our base load by creating this basic buffer of bicarb. So a lower bicarb is going to lead to an acidosis and a higher bicarb is going to lead to an alkalosis. So now that brings us to our actual algorithms. The first step in our algorithm is determining whether or not something is acidemic or alkalemic. And then the next thing is what is the primary disturbance? Is it metabolic or respiratory? And you've probably seen this table many times before. And it, for me, when I was first learning, it was very confusing. Um, and especially when you're starting to think about ABGs in just the numbers and you don't have a table in front of you, it gets kind of confusing. So the way I like to break it down is just kind of taking it in one dimensionally. Is it respiratory or is it not as our very first step? So the way that I do that is just look at the PaCO2. So the first thing is, if it is acidemic, what is the PaCO2? Is it elevated? Then it's going to be a respiratory acidosis. Why? Because we're retaining all the CO2. It's driving our CO2 up and it's leading to our acidosis. And that explains our acidosis. If it is not, and we still have an acidosis, that means it's due to something else. It's due to some type of metabolic cause. Now the converse is going to be true. If we have an alkalosis, we have a basic pH and our PaCO2 is low, meaning we're hyperventilating. And that's true, meaning yes, then we're going to have a respiratory alkalosis because our respiratory alkalosis, our CO2 explains why we have an alkalosis, right? And if it's not, then we're going to have some type of other causes, meaning a metabolic alkalosis. We'll see an example in a second. So if we have a pH that's 7.3, that automatically is just going to eliminate all of these guys down right here. So that was our first step. Now we're going to look at the pHCO2. So we're just going to look at this guy right here, and we're, we're looking at step one right here. So if the pHCO2 is elevated, it's going to be a respiratory acidosis, right? Because nothing else can cause a pHCO to be high as well as having a low pH, right? So that's going to essentially tell us, is it respiratory acidosis? And if it's not, then we know it's got to be a metabolic alkalosis. And we can do the same thing with the respiratory situation below. So you can kind of think about this kind of going slowly, step by step, and maybe using some examples, and it'll make pretty good sense. So once we know that it's a respiratory acidosis, then we're kind of, we're good right there. But now if it's a metabolic acidosis, it gets a little bit more tricky. So when we're dealing with the primary metabolic acidosis, we have to think about it in a couple different ways. The first thing is going to be the anion gap. And the anion gap, what exactly is it? So the anion gap, the equation is sodium minus chloride minus bicarb. Essentially, it explains all the unmeasured anions. So it's going to be protein, phosphate, citrate, sulfate, and other things. And if it is high, if the anion gap is high, meaning there's other anions that aren't explained, it's going to be due to some other cause. And a high anion gap means we have an anion gap acidosis. And there's a few causes. Mud pilers is going to be the mnemonic that you probably are most familiar with. If it's a high anion gap, then we can start to think about all these different mud pilers causes. If it's a low, or I'm sorry, a normal anion gap, then we're going to start thinking about uh, renal tubular acidosis or diarrhea. So it's going to be a much smaller list of things. You've probably heard that there's also an osmol gap that we have to calculate, um, and that just makes things more complicated. So I, I like to think of it just as if there's a high anion gap, then we have an anion gap acidosis, and it could be anything within the mud pilers. And then you start, have to start thinking about the clinical perspective of what may be causing this. For more educational resources, like our medical ID cards, check out medicalbasics.com.
So the last thing we do is that if we do have an anion gap that's elevated, the next thing we have to do is calculate a delta gap. And a delta gap essentially tells us, is there something else that is going on to explain the acidosis besides just the anion gap acidosis? And so that's really, the delta gap, if it's low, then there's going to be an additional non-anion gap acidosis. And if it's high, then there's going to be an additional metabolic alkalosis. We'll see that the anion gap acidosis is always going to be present, but we're also going to potentially have an additional component. And obviously, if it's normal, 22 to 26, that means the only thing that's going on is an anion gap acidosis. So the way that I like to think about a delta gap is just kind of based off the equation right here. So we have our patient's anion gap, and we have our normal anion gap. And really, that's between 8 to 12. So that's kind of how our equation works. What I like to do is once I've calculated it, I like to think about it conceptually of just delta gap is kind of like assessing our expected bicarb. So if we have a high delta gap, then we're going to have a high bicarb. So that means there's something else that's causing the bicarb to be higher than the expected just from our anion gap acidosis alone. So if we have a high bicarb, remember bicarb is a basic buffer, that means we're going to have some type of metabolic alkalosis that's also contributing to our anion gap acidosis. Now the converse is going to be true. If we had a low delta gap, that essentially means that we have a lower than expected bicarb. That means something else is driving the bicarb to be lower. Something else is causing it to have an additional metabolic acidosis. So we've already had an anion gap acidosis. So the only thing else that can contribute to that is going to be a non-anion gap acidosis. So when we look at this table, we can kind of summarize everything right here. So to sum it all up, once we have determined that it's a metabolic acidosis versus everything else, uh, what we're going to do is we first calculate an anion gap and we determine whether or not it's diarrhea or RTA if it's normal or whether or not it's due to one of these mud piler causes if it's a high anion gap. And then after that, once we know that it's a high anion gap, we're going to calculate a delta gap to determine if it's low, that means we have something else that's contributing to the acidosis, namely a non-anion gap acidosis. And if it's high, that means there's something else that's contributing more bicarb or some type of alkalotic component, a metabolic alkalosis in addition to our anion gap acidosis. In the next video, I'm actually going to walk through an algorithm that shows you all the different causes of everything, metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, and respiratory acidosis, as well as respiratory alkalosis. Be sure to check out medicalbasics.com for more educational resources like our HP notebook. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more tips and lessons.